Okay, well, welcome everyone. As I said, this is Stacy Miller with the Farmers Market Coalition, and I'm going to be the moderator today for this webinar. This is the first in a series of three winter webinars that are hosted by the Farmers Market Coalition in partnership with the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, which is one of FMC's member organizations in Pennsylvania. And they have uh, more than 6,000 members from all over the Mid-Atlantic and are partnering with us on this webinar series that we have designed um, in order to help farmers markets strengthen their position in the marketplace by understanding the characteristics of their customer base, building brands worthy of community support, and staying competitive in a rapidly evolving local food scene. So, um, an increasing number of markets and market networks, as, as many of you probably know, are, are conducting research on their customer bases, and they're, they're smart to do so as markets seek to reach new audiences in their communities and expand their customer bases beyond what we consider the core, it's really important to understand who that core is and to not lose sight of the need uh, to serve them and continually evolve in order to meet their needs because there's there are a number of outlets now where people can buy uh, local food and have the um, have access to far fresh farm products and farmers markets in order to, to stay competitive really need to understand their roots and know who they're serving and what those shoppers' motivations are and um, some of the characteristics that, that are associated with them. And, and from there can um, better understand how to bring more um, what might be called second tier shoppers into that core base. So. Uh, don't want to talk too much before our presenters get started, but I do want to discuss a little bit of, of housekeeping. We've designed this session to have adequate time for questions and discussions at the end. But before um, we get started, I'll explain how the Q&A will work. They'll use, you can use the questions pod um, in the gray webinar panel throughout the session to type in your questions before you forget them. And I definitely suggest doing that. If you have a question, Go ahead and type it in there before you forget it. If it's addressed later, then you know we can ignore it or we can come back to you. Is this still a relevant question? Um, but go ahead and type it in before you forget it, and it'll go into the queue for addressing during the Q&A period at the end. And if your question or comment is maybe too complicated um, to type in and you think you can remember it until the end of the session, then you can always raise your hand during that Q&A period, and Liz can unmute your line at that time. So discussion is always good. We're going to try to leave plenty of time for that. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenters. Ann Freeman is the manager of the Dufferin Grove Organic Farmers Market in Toronto and is the coordinator of the Greenbelt Farmers Market Network, a project which aims to increase success of markets and farming in and around Ontario's Greenbelt. And Hélène St. Jacques is the president of Informa Market Research She's a consumer and a market research expert with a history that spans many food, health, social justice, and environmental sectors. Her background includes working on local, national, and international fronts with large and small size public and private sector organizations. She has a unique, wide-ranging perspective based on work covering all sectors of the value food chain from farm to table, including distribution through farmers markets. And we do want to say um, that we've created a, a handout, a resource list that includes some additional customer-based research that's been done in the last few years that might be relevant for those of you who are thinking about doing a customer-based survey at a, um, a regional or a statewide level, or even a local level, and some additional research on just demographic, um, how to research demographics and market segmentation. So. Um, We'll put that in the chat pod, a link to that, where it will go straight to um, the PDF on our website. So you can look at it as we're going through. And um, you'll be able to refer to it later. And it will go out in the email after the webinar um, to all of you that has the recording in it as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this off to Anne. And we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to have you with us. Let's see. 
Um, Stacy, if you can just hand the slideshow over to us now, we'll get started. All right. In progress, there's always a few seconds of lag here. Okay. You want to just tell me when it comes up on your screen? That would be great. You're good to go. Okay. So as we've discussed, we're going to talk about using surveys to make more shoppers core shoppers. Uh, this is a topic that's really interesting for us. I want to give you just a bit of background on who we are and where we're coming from since uh, our audience is from so many different places. So the map that you can see on your screen now uh, shows the western end of Lake Ontario. It's what we call the Golden Horseshoe, which is Canada's most densely populated area. This is also an area of really excellent farmland and many special natural features. So in 2005, our provincial government created a green belt to impose some limits on urban sprawl, which is a big issue in our area. And this was an attempt to protect the farmland and the recreational areas and environmentally sensitive land as well. And all those dots you can see on the market or on the map are markets that we work with. Our market project is in its fifth year and we're funded by the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation and we work with nearly a hundred different markets in this area. Uh, the dense cluster is Toronto. There's over 30 markets within Toronto. And then you can see we also have small town and suburban and uh, smaller city markets all through the area. Uh, they're markets of all sizes and all ages, from brand new to more than a century old. And our goal is to increase their success. Uh, we do research, we do information sharing, professional development for managers, and some small grants to markets and farmers. So let's go now to the study we're going to talk about uh, as our focus today. When we started developing our network, we first carried out a survey of market managers and farmers to learn about some of their key concerns. That was with working with Alain from Informa, who's with me today. And then we turned our attention to market customers. We knew that a lot of our managers were not in a position to carry out a lot of research on their own, but they could really use this kind of information. And some of our aims are there on the screen. Uh, we wanted to really help them understand their customers and strengthen their relationships in their communities. We knew they needed benchmarks for the future. And uh, we really wanted to focus on helping them tell the story of what's happening at farmers markets to a wide range of audiences, whether that's the media or funders or board members or even their own vendors. I'm going to hand it over to Alain for a moment to talk about why we need to look at customers in particular. Thank you, Anne, and hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be part of this. Uh, the farmer's market segment is in revival mode, as you well know, because uh, one factor, the key factor is they are linking farmers with very willing eaters. The resurgence is happening because of this increasing demand for local, healthy food that can be trusted. Trust is a big factor. It's now up to us to understand why people are flocking to these markets. What are the competitive advantages? What are our strengths and the weaknesses of markets in the very wide array of other food distribution options? What drives people particularly to markets? And what can farmers markets do better, given that we've got limited resources and constraints? And I see it, too, as a, a critical factor that we honor both the farmers who are working so hard to produce this wonderful food and the very keen shoppers by aiding and connecting them, hence the purpose of the research. The other reason is the harsh reality of limited marketing and promotional resources. They have to be spent as efficiently and as effectively as possible to reach key shopper groups with messages of interest. Uh, and in this way, farmers markets are no different than um, all these packaged goods products from whence I come. Those companies all know who their customers are. So in um, this application, research is helping managers to determine who are their shoppers, how to best reach them, and what content is desired. So let's look at some of the findings from the study. Um, up on the screen here, you see our typical shopper according to our results. So the 2010 study found that the shopper is female, age 50 to 60, born in Canada, university educated, professionally employed, 
and in a household of two adults. Uh, we might think more families are sharing the, the shopping load uh, between the genders, and of course there are men represented in the study as well, but still quite a, a strong dominance of female shoppers. Um, and before I go too far, I want to say we need to consider, of course, how our approach to collecting data affects the results we get. So um, actually, I'll just go back to looking at those, those women shopping for a moment. Ellen's going to add more on this later, but I'd like to say um, there's always a bias that has to be considered. So in our case, this was a voluntary survey, and it did require internet access. We got a high urban response rate, and that would reflect population in part, but it might also partly be due to easier access to high-speed internet in the city than in rural areas. We also, of course, did not get a lot of responses from speakers of languages other than English, and we didn't get a lot of responses from low income customers who might not have access to a computer as readily. So we have to think about that and be aware of that when we're considering what we heard. Um, and some of you who manage individual markets might also be thinking, well, that's not my typical shopper, which is, is fine. Of course, this is a group survey, so it does merge a lot of results. Uh, and your knowledge of what makes your market unique is part of its success, of course. But let's look some more at what our, our study said. So we're going to look at what we call core shoppers, what we've labeled as big shoppers according to spending uh, in comparison with smaller shoppers. Uh, looking at the big shopper, so these people are really coming for groceries. Three quarters of these shoppers are the primary grocery buyer in their household. This is a person with a lot of experience. This is not a novelty seeker. It's the smaller shopper who comes for a specific item or maybe for an event. And you'll notice it's also that smaller shopper who is more likely to buy prepared foods. Back to the big shoppers, they often have several markets to choose from. So the habit gets reinforced by that added exposure. We sometimes worry about having nearby markets, but having other neighboring markets isn't all bad. It's not just about competition, it's about reinforcing that habit and access. These are not typically members of very large households or parents of young children. Um, although we did ask uh, everybody where they find local food in addition to markets, and we found that shoppers really care about local. And some of the larger families indicated that they go to pick your own farms as a way to get some of their local food. So price may be a factor. Um, of course, the busyness of the family schedule may also be a factor in how easy it is to attend a market. In all the shoppers, a huge majority said that what they like most is buying fresh, local, tasty food in a way that supports local farmers and in a friendly, relaxed atmosphere. And many people also told us that markets inspire them to try new foods, to eat healthier, and even to eat more meals with their families, which we thought was really positive. So now let's look at where managers can learn from this and think about where to invest their efforts. So looking at that uh, chart, we have an impressive history of shopping at markets from our customers. Shoppers tend to develop the farmer's market habit over time. And our core group has a very long history. The biggest slice of the pie at 32% is uh, more than 10 years, the biggest single slice. And then if we add up um, almost 3 quarters, or approximately 3 quarters, have more than 3 years shopping experience at markets. And the findings from our study were really backed up by a Pacific Coast farmers market study that also showed the longer customers attend markets, the more frequently they come, and the more money they spend. Uh, and many of our other findings were also backed up in that Pacific Coast study as well. Um, customers who've been shopping at markets for only a year tend to spend less money. So this really suggests that managers should focus a lot of efforts on developing and supporting those loyal customers not so much maybe on a, always attracting new customers. It's a kind of a slow build, and that long-term loyal person is very, very important to your success. As managers, we often feel a lot of pressure to plan and, and carry out many special events. And in our photo, you can see that that manager looks like she's having a lot of fun doing that. But our core customers are not telling us that they're coming to be entertained. Um, maybe the small shopper, the infrequent visitor might be attracted by an event, but fun events were actually quite low on the like most list. So we have to consider that in terms of where to put most of our energy. And when we're thinking about the core shopper, we might serve her well by supporting her interest in cooking. So 
also maybe if we're going to do events, they might be chef demos, which could also, of course, link us to the local community, local businesses, local celebrities, uh, recipes, educational materials. These things might really be appreciated. Any of us who cook day in and day out know that it can get pretty boring. And the number of TV food shows also tells us that people have a pretty much insatiable appetite for food inspiration. I would say that these kind of offerings would also help to build the confidence of that small shopper who's not spending much yet, maybe who's buying more prepared foods, maybe they need a little encouragement to try more cooking. And of course we want to think about building support of the next generation. I've heard of an encouraging trend in Germany towards young people buying sustainably produced food together and cooking in instead of going out. And that would be really great if we could encourage that kind of thinking. We could also think about other services that could have an impact. So that big shopper, big volume shopper, might love some carryout help. One of our larger markets is looking into shopping carts, kind of market-friendly, smaller size carts, because they're finding that when shoppers can't carry anymore, they go home. And maybe they'd buy more if their arms weren't aching um, and they had a way to uh, tote the food around like we expect to have in a supermarket. I want to look next at some barriers, so more of the negative side. Um, and I would like to stress here, these results don't stand out as strongly as the positive ones. Complaints were relatively few. Uh, most of the people who did the survey really love markets. Um, even here, if you notice, no cash wasn't a strong response, although I think we have to keep revisiting that one as the cashless shopping trend continues. But people have been willing to go the distance to you know, bring cash to markets, to accept our schedules and the other demands that come with shopping at a farmer's market. As far as major limitations, limited hours and days of operation or seasonality were kind of the key thing. A lot of people said the hours were problematic, 29%. 45% said the short season was a deterrent. So if we can do anything to lengthen our season, that might be something we could put our attention towards. Prices did get mentioned uh, as an issue for some. This is one where I would argue we need to keep working on both sides of that. Um, customer education, as far as uh, really helping people understand where they're getting great value at markets and what it takes to grow good food and also helping our growers to develop efficiencies and to really highlight what they can offer at great value. So not talking about cheap food, but there's always room for improvement and for showing off what we do best. Some shoppers at smaller markets also talked about limited selection, so size can be a factor in how satisfying the experience is too. Um, let's look at how some improvements could be made. So you can see, again, percentages are quite low here, but Expanding opening hours or days was really the number one request. Uh, product choices, size and layout, this could be to do with crowd control in some cases, making it easier to get around the market. Um, and some people wanted more advertising, more vendors, a few more things like that. But we're, we're looking at fairly small numbers. In terms of suggesting what they'd really like, the requests are pretty reasonable. They'd like to sit down. They want educational materials. They want good signage. They want easy access to a washroom. These all sound pretty reasonable to me. And given how low the percentage rates were on suggestions for improvement and how clearly our customers are saying they care about markets and local food, I think one of our really major resources for improving attendance is to ask our most loyal fans to be our ambassadors. And going back to that Pacific Coast study, word of mouth is the most common way people learn about their local markets. And we know that advertising costs a lot. And we know that when we look at surveys like this, our customers really care. They do want to help. Let's ask our regulars to help us spread the word. I'm going to talk a little bit next about uh, using the findings. First, as, a, as our network did, and then we'll talk more. I'll hand it over to Elen to talk more about, uh, in detail, some of the other responses we might have to the findings. So as a network, uh, when we looked at the study, Farmers market shoppers made many comments about health. They told us that markets have really positively affected what they cook, what they consume, what they know about food, and how it's grown, and how they even define healthy food. And the mention we made earlier of some even saying they share more meals with family and household members, this all made us think we wanted to look at the health impacts of markets. 
So we carried out a further study that we called our Healthy Habits Study to look for evidence of that, thinking that that might really be a beneficial tool for markets. And we also found, as I've just been talking about, that the shopper study found customers wanting more. More selection, more prepared food, more organic food, longer hours, longer seasons. So our funders asked us what we could do with that to bring that into action. And in 2012, we had a new products program, which offered micro-grants to farmers to help them bring new products to market. Uh, and that was really exciting. We, we sponsored 66 small-scale projects. We had a lot of farmers looking at season extension so that they would have a longer seasonal availability of foods. Uh, a lot of people put up hoop houses. We also had a lot of farmers saying they wanted to add to the diversity of the foods available at market. So we had a lot of world crops being tried, uh, which may be really important in attracting a broader spectrum for our audience, um, and some new convenience foods as well. I'm going to pass this over to Alain now to look at the communication side of things. Thank you, Anne. Um, yes. Now, the, um, the bar chart that you see in front of you, what we did is ask people uh, what was the best way, the most effective way of reaching them with uh, messages about the market. And as you can see there, uh, email, email and website, uh, those two were uh, uh, the most preferred. And by the way, when we're talking websites here, we've learned that they're not only interested in the market website, but it's super if the vendors have a website, because people want to literally do a, a little tour of these farms sometimes. And then you'll see uh, lower down there is uh, local newspapers. Uh, I don't know about your your experiences there, but here um, in the uh, age of declining print, local newspapers still uh, have a central role to play, uh, particularly with some of our older customers. They automatically turn to the local newspaper for uh, both editorial and advertising about what's going on. And these roadside stands, signs they like, brochures, flyers, etc. So. We also note here there is a, a difference between the older and the younger shopper, the old digital divide here. So it's, it isn't an easy task for market managers because now, um, uh, unlike previous eras, you could just run a, a few ads, put a few notices in uh, your local newspaper, and that would be it. Bob's your uncle. Not anymore. Um, so really, what we're asking you to do is not that the message is different, necessarily, but that um, you expand to as many channels as you possibly can. Uh, now, why would you be doing this? First of all, there's, there's a couple of things. You're, in addition to trying to attract new shoppers, which are the harder ones to get, the, as they say, the low-hanging fruit are the people that are already coming to the market. They have the market habit. They love the market. So what you're trying to do is continue to reinforce behavior. A lot of advertising that we're exposed to is doing exactly that just reinforcing, um, giving people or just reminding people of all the wonderful reasons they're shopping in that market in the first place. And as Anne has indicated, these events, uh, special events, can be incredibly draining. On the other hand, um, they do tend to attract, if you could call them the tire kickers, oh boy, I'd be meaning to go to the market and Today they're having a, a, a pork special, right? A big barbecue pig. And that will bring in the hordes. Now hopefully, part of that, that mob, that lovely group of people, some of them will get a chance to kind of nose around, see the different vendors, start having conversations, and see that there's something there for them that they just might want to bring back some other time. And um, 
of course, these events can go viral using social media, Twitter, and the old very, very powerful word of mouth. And all the money that's spent in mass media, often what they're trying to do is to generate talk, word of mouth, endorsements from people who have experienced this. In fact, that's a whole new brand of marketing now where they hire people to uh, talk about these new products, um, even though they're being paid to do so. Now, pulling back a bit, marketing is a science, and it, it is the science of choosing target markets through the market analysis and segmentation, which we talked about a bit earlier, and that is through research. Market managers and vendors have roles to play in the communication and marketing, and it involves planning and ensuring a steady rollout of messages. Um, that's the thing. It's an insatiable beast, if you will. Communication, always fresh things to say. And um, while we're thinking about this farmer's market communication, uh, we cannot forget the role of vendors and those conversations that they have. Because in essence, um, they are marketers and communicators. People are there because they want to connect with those, those growers. And it's not just enough to walk up to the stand and look at those beautiful carrots, beets, etc. But often, um, they're looking for some advice sometimes. How to store it? What do I do, for instance, with bee tops and the, the stories behind this? What bee tops? can uh, do for you and how they can be so tasty. Shoppers also, although this is, can be some try, trying times for producers, they want to know a bit about the farm and they will ask um, questions, and I'm sure you hear about this, um, about growing practices. They're just coming often to a vocabulary around understanding the unique differences of markets. and. Uh, that they can actually have these dialogues uh, and learn. And while these exchanges take time, people really are genuinely interested in learning. Um, that gives them another reason for being at the markets. Because as we know, um, at supermarkets, uh, try asking somebody in the produce department how to cook these beet tops. I don't think you would get much out there. So let's look at some research, um, and this is trying to uh, distill it into the, some simple maxims. Now, while markets, um, in essence, are very relaxed venues, shoppers are there to shop. They have uh, things to do, to learn, to meet and greet, and it's a social occasion. Um, so we have to be very judicious in how, if you choose to do interviewing in markets, keep it very, very brief. Only ask a few easy to answer questions. We call these the closed-ended questions that are easy for you to fill out that is, and to tally so you can get fast results. Um, on, in these short um, exposures, veer away from any personal information including uh, I have a, a strong aversion to um, household income. Um, that tends to be a problem. Perhaps it's a Canadian problem, but people either lie or they just refuse to answer. The other thing, too, is uh, we all I don't, aren't equally blessed with the ability to walk up to strangers and put on a friendly face, um, no matter what they're looking like. So please, it's, it's very important to train an interviewer and that they are have a friendly, open disposition and they're able to approach a wide range of people, young and old. Um, longer surveys, and that's what we have done. We've had um, the opportunity to do an online survey. That by far is the stronger one. 
bearing in mind that people have to have internet access. That is the one barrier. The thing about online surveys is the if they're programmed through a professional programmer, and I'm happy to answer questions like that off, um, off this seminar, um, people have the opportunity to go to the survey and to interrupt it while they're completing it and then go back in at a later point when they have the time. Online surveys are 24-7. You can also embed visuals and videos and all sorts of things in there. They have that beauty. Now, um, how we did it is we um, had a, a postcard design, this nice postcard that you're seeing on screen. And um, at 30 odd markets, is that right, Anne? Yes, um, these were distributed, inviting people to come to our online survey. and. Um, the why would they do that? Well, they love their markets, uh, but also it's always nice to have a little incentive and those $100 market prizes um, were very popular. So that's the way we did it and we had 339 shoppers. Um, let's see, now of course they're self-selected. But in any survey, I have to tell you, only census are not self-selected. Everybody has to participate. So invariably, um, it is a self-selection process. Now, when you're designing the questionnaire, um, <laughs> it's everything in the kitchen sink. You, you really have to have a disciplined approach. And I, I suggest make a wish list of all the items that you'd like to ask and then go through it again and categorize it according to must know and need to know. Do not think that one survey is going to answer all your questions for all time. So it requires discipline. Also, when you're designing your questionnaire, apply logic in the flow of questions. So if you're asking people about how they got to the market, how long it took them to get them to the market. Have, have areas of questions grouped together so that it makes it easier for people. Don't have a chop change logic. And keep the questions wording as simple and straightforward as possible, not open for interpretation. Now, to complete our survey online, it took about 10 minutes. Some people take longer than others. We had a few what I call essay type questions, that is open-ended. People could write as much or as little as they wanted. And we have a sample for you of an abbreviated survey. It's connected with this uh, webinar. Analysis of results. Now when you're writing these, this questionnaire, always think of how am I going to analyze it? Um, because with open-ended questions, what you're going to have to do is input all that and develop code frames. And that is a complicated thing to do. So bear in mind that they have to be tallied and try and make that easy for yourself. OK? So just to conclude and get on towards some uh, discussion with you, um, we found that collecting information can have quite a big impact on making strategic decisions. And so we'd really encourage you to try some research at your market, but it can be in a way that makes sense for you. Uh, a quick one or two question survey can still mean a lot in terms of gathering a key uh, piece of information that you need. Major ones do involve a lot of time and resources, so they may not be for everybody. Um, but we're going to have to keep doing this kind of research as our sector matures. We need to keep learning as things change in communication patterns, in spending styles, in diversity of products, and so on. So uh, it's still very much an ongoing thing. The good news, though, is that our customers are so optimistic. Um, in, our, in our case, 9 out of 10 people surveyed said markets are here to stay. They don't see them as a trend. They see them as something really important and something they want to support. And so we're, we're excited to be here with you to have the chance to talk more about your concerns and your ideas. Um, I'm going to hand this back to Stacy, and we're going to look at some questions next. 
And our contact info is here. We'll show it again at the end as well. Stacy, over to you. Sorry about that. I had to unmute my phone. Thank you so much, both of you, for um, sharing that great presentation and uh, managing, handing it off between each other so seamlessly. That was great. Um, so we do have a, uh, a few comments here. Um, I do just want to say that I really found it refreshing that you discussed how the research was translating into management changes or could potentially translate into management changes. I think uh, it's really important to be reminded about the downsides of making assumptions that, that loyalty is a static quality that our, that our customers have. Um, and that loyalty is, is earned with every interaction, which you, which you really reiterated. Um, and we hope to go further in depth on that topic of customer loyalty um, in our third webinar in this series in, in March. Darlene uh, Walnick had a comment, um, and you know, you may not require a response, but I just, I just wanted to, to mention it. She said that you made a great point about nearby markets reinforcing shopping, not just simply being competition, and I think that's a that's an interesting navigation that that markets um, have to to deal with is that um, cooperation. I don't know if you have any research that suggests the the power of that kind of clustering effect. So the you know the more car dealerships there are on a certain stretch of road, the more cars are bought. Um, overall, it sort of increases the the atmosphere that is conducive to people making that kind of a purchase, the more options that people have. Um, so I think I think that's that's interesting. Um, as with that is. Thanks, Arlene. Great to hear from you. Um, certainly, in our part of Toronto, we noticed that very kind of trend with many coffee shops of a similar sort popping up, and I think to some extent uh, the proliferation of markets in Toronto has reinforced the idea that. Yeah, this is a normal part of life. This is something you should build into your week. We do talk about market groupies, that is, people that you see at three or four markets a week. And, and some of us kind of shake our heads saying, well, they're not eating three or four times as much, but maybe they are really building in support. Certainly some of our individual farmer vendors say, you know, people will follow them from market to market. And if they can't make it to one, they'll make it to another. Um, and hopefully we work as allies because I think we're, we're better off working as allies than as competitors in this field. We have enough uh, enough on our plates. I'm making too many food puns here, but uh, enough work to be done without competing with other markets as much as helping each other out. Amen. Um, Rebecca Kiernan has a question. Do you think it would be effective to work with local colleges and, in your experience, have students um, having students create and conduct research as part of their school projects? Or do you, do you see that as potentially being too intrusive to have um, students doing, doing work that may be, um, they may be there one semester and gone the next semester? Do you, do you work with students at all? Well, um, I've had good experiences and not good experiences with that. Um, you, you have to usually con form to the students' time needs or, and availability, which uh, can really place constraints on what you're doing. And uh, I, you know, bear that in mind. The other thing is uh, students have, on the positive side, um, energy and optimism, but I have had problems when um, students react negatively to people who have negative things to say. So you have to be a good actor or an inter as an interviewer, really, you should be a journalist. Think about that. Or a little bit of a court reporter where you have no opinion whatsoever and you're constantly friendly no matter what that person says. So the, the upsides and the downsides. I thought you were going to say, I'd bring them in, um, if you can, for their advertising and their um, social media smarts. They're really good at this stuff. And they can fan out and uh, help create messages to reach that uh, younger demographic. 
um, I think your point about objectivity is really important too. That oftentimes it's easy when you're doing either a dot survey or an on-site paper survey, or you're you're anywhere trying to get kind of a random sampling of folks, um, unless you're using some strict methodology about every tenth person that you see. You're asking if it's a lot easier to approach the people who look like they're happy to be there, or look more like you as the researcher, or just seem like they're friendlier to approach for whatever reason. And there's all kinds of kind of cultural um, issues to to address there. Um, so being careful about who you approach and making sure that your your sample is, is as random as you as you can get it, I guess. Um, so our next question is how how you would suggest surveying um, an area as a prospective location for a farmer's market. Um, and then I guess there's a follow-up question to that. How do you attract farmers and vendors to a new market? And that may be something that's beyond the scope of this, this particular topic. But, but first, how, how might you suggest surveying an area as a prospective location? Oh, I'm glad Jeff sees easy questions. <laughs> um, how would I survey? I, I immediately would. There's a real logic here, and uh, supermarket locations do incredible analysis of the demographics of the neighborhood, um, the uh, catchment area, how, and they they have formulas for this, how far you can expect someone to travel. And we know, um, certainly within cities, that it should be in relatively close proximity to your to your home or on major transit lines. Um, so I would look at that. How far is it to the next farmer's market, uh, market or markets? Um, secondly, you could actually do a survey. I mean, I just love the idea of doing a randomized survey in the community and I currently ask people, um, where they shop for their food, you know, primary shopping locations and secondary, and then um, provide them with a short list of, you know, are they going, for instance, what we're learning is some of our shoppers are so keen on local, local access or localizing what they're eating that they go from a farmer's market, they will go out to a U-Pick operation. When they're driving around in the countryside, they our, they shop farm gate. I mean, they're really looking for those kinds of experiences. So you could do a survey in the uh, neighborhood. Don't stand outside of the supermarket because you just might get into the problems there. But um, I would do a survey and see what comes up there. Is there a real desire for local that's being unmet? Just to add to that, uh, we won't get in to a lot of detail about vendor recruitment today, but um, we have had a couple of really successful examples of community teams that wanted to start markets doing a survey in their neighborhood, um, both randomized, as Alain said, and maybe also collecting signatures at certain events where they could see uh, people indicating interest. And they have used those results very effectively to show to farmers this is a desirable area to come to. Uh, this is a, an area where the community really wants a market. As we've had more markets opening, it's a tougher sell to convince people to jump in and try a new market. They have to be pretty convinced that it's going to be a strong location. And so that kind of background work is pretty essential um, to be able to launch in a strong way. Um, great. Um, I have a question that sort of segues into one that we, we have here um, from, from Katie Hassemer. So you suggested that people who shopped at markets for 10 years or more are in the higher spending category, or what I've heard referred to as uh, first tier customers, which may point to the importance of uh, patience in transitioning the smaller spenders to the, the bigger spending category. So as smaller as smaller spenders, using some of the strategies that you recommended, uh, as the smaller shoppers transition to larger, bigger shoppers, I would hope it would, you know, it would stand a reason that that would leave a vacuum for more non-shoppers to move into that smaller spending category. Um, and of course, those non-shoppers are not very easy to research. Are there 
ways that you can better understand the demographics of a community based on, um, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking across the border here, but in, in terms of zip code analysis or other location um, analysis that may not, that could be independent of researching um, an actual shopping population because if they're not shopping there, you can't, you can't survey them. Um, do you have any resources on how people can better understand the market base that's not shopping there, um, just using you know government resources or other um, Nielsen or other market segmentation resources? Oh my, if only. Um, <laughs> one thing where we are um, we're humble and mighty all at the same time. These uh, supermarket uh, chains and the brands have a vast amount of proprietorial data, which of course we can't access. Industry associations have that too, but they won't give it to us. Um, so no, that is the answer really to your question. We don't know. And the only way of going about it is for markets, um, or I, I like to group them all into this alternative distribution channels, that's good food boxes, I mean that's the whole plethora of non-traditional uh, vendors that are locally oriented, if only some uh, um, willingness to work together and pooling of money and access of grants, then cumulatively you could potentially fund something. That's the only way that I can suggest. Are there any rules of thumb about uh, characteristics or limitations or other specific farmers market research that you're aware of that's specifically around uh, lower income shoppers or, you know, and I'm speaking across the border here, but the, the program that we have um, here in the U.S., the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP, um, which, you know, millions and millions of Americans are on um, every year how we better serve them, or are there characteristics that um, that could go along with some of the, the smaller spending categories? Um, that was Katie. Well, uh, the contrast between Canada and the U.S. is is a big one in that regard. We've kind of looked on with some amazement at the, the scale of the supplemental nutrition assistance programs and how that has impacted markets in the U.S. because we just don't have something like that here although we do have quite a, a range of markets experimenting with different market buck or market voucher or other support programs that they are trying at markets um, on a small scale. Um, but yeah, we, we don't really have that kind of data so much in Canada because our structure of uh, social benefits is very, very different here. Um, wait, well then I'll, I'll change tack entirely. Um, Mehdi and Cesari, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, has a question about social media and why you think Twitter is not that effective to reach people, uh, especially younger couples. Any thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I wasn't speculating there. I'm reflecting the data that we saw. Yeah, um, Facebook better, a bit better. But um, I think it also is a reflection of our... Um, or the profile of our um, dominant shoppers. They're older people, and they don't use those tools significantly. Mm -hmm. but I imagine and I changed. add, though, I was mentioning that uh, this kind of research is very much an ongoing process. And even the difference uh, from 2010 to now, if you look at Twitter and Facebook, we all know things keep shifting. Um, some of us hadn't heard of Twitter in 2010, right? It's, it's constantly changing. So we do have examples now of markets in our network in relatively young communities, communities with a lot of young families, where they have a lot of Twitter followers, and they are finding that for a fairly easy amount of effort on market day, they can send out a few messages that might, might just bring a few people running down to the market when they hear there's you know fresh melons or something like that that have just arrived. So. 
I am hearing from, you know, anecdotally from some managers that they're finding it kind of a fun thing to do that they can do right at the market and it's not too difficult. Great. Um, Susie Steyer, you, you had your hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you and um, if, you, if your question is no longer relevant, then just say so, but I'll, I'll mute you so you can ask it now. Susie, are you there? Maybe it's going to take her a moment. Um, Susie, while it, we'll wait a minute for you, but we have a question from Robin in the meantime. Um, has targeting a neighborhood with a postcard as a marketing, not, not an invitation to take a survey, but as a marketing tactic, has that ever worked in your experience, targeting a specific neighborhood based on demographics in that neighborhood, um, is inviting them to, sh to shop at market? Have either of you have experience with that? I do know that there was a group of new markets that opened, um, organized by our provincial market association that used uh, postcard drops quite extensively, but really it's, it's beyond the budget of most of our markets. Um, it's, it's a little bit costly to do a broad scale drop, so I'd be all for it if, if I could afford it. <laughs> The, um, Susie, are you there? Maybe your question had already been, um, had already been answered. We, I did want to mention that there, there is some research, for those of you who have had a chance to look at that PDF handout that we offered a link to in the chat window, that does include links both to the Greenbelt Farmers Market 2010 research that that Anne and Helena have been referring to today, as well as their 2012 study, which focused a little bit more on actual health impacts of, of markets. The, um, the other items that are on that include something um, from, the Niel from Nielsen or Claritas, which does a lot of market segmentation research. And I, I believe if you type in zip codes in there, it will generate a, a little report about certain um, different kinds of profiles of customer bases that live within that zip code. And some of them are, are kind of quirky and funny, um, but it does break things down into the age um, in a household, whether or not they have children, what their income status is. and there's some, as Helen referred to, it's a very sophisticated tool that a lot of retailers are using. There's a link to that in there. And of course, there are a lot of paid services um, on that website, but I believe that zip code search tool is, is free. And that was used by the Pacific Coast Farmers Market Association a few years ago in a study to try to understand that market segmentation of market shoppers in, um, in some markets in California. And that study is also referenced in that handout. So if you have a chance, check those out. I think they're, they're interesting uh, resources for further, for further research. Um, give Susie one more chance to, to ask her question. Um, I unmuted your line, Susie, but um, maybe you need to press star six. Okay, well, maybe she'll follow up with her question over the email. Yeah, we would welcome a note from you if you've got a question that we haven't had a chance to address or you think of something a little bit later. Great. Well, any last thoughts from our presenters? Thank you so much for, um, for, sharing, for sharing all of your great information. Certainly, it's our pleasure. Oh. Oh, we do have one last question. I have one minute, so I'll, I'll try to get, squeeze this out. Um, Kirsten Weigel says that her market conducted a successful web-based survey at the end of the 2012 market season, but how often do you recommend repeating customer surveys? Um, and is there a time of the season or time of year that, that you might recommend for doing that? Uh, well, I'd probably do it, uh, if you're going to do it uh, in the next year or two, you could go a, a second, two years, uh, 
try and conduct it at the same time so you can actually, you know, spring to spring or fall to fall um, and do it during the, the peak time. And that's usually fall, isn't it? Summer's, summer's not so great. Um, that's what I would suggest. If you can do it annually, great, but you're going to start seeing substantial or significant differences probably two years on. Mm -hmm. But you can fill in that year gap with a little on-site, as Anne was saying, one, two, or three questions maximum. And also, by the way, surveying, some of you, it's a bit of a project to do, but it does say to your shoppers that you are interested in their opinion. It's a positive thing to do. So I think we're going to be signing off soon. I, I will say goodbye. This is Elaine. Well, again, thanks thank so much for joining us, everybody. Um, any of you, if you have questions, you know, you can email them to, to Anne and Helen, and I'm sure they will um, take a little bit of time if, uh, over the next few days to respond if you have any specific questions. But thank you so much, and look, uh, look for the recording to go out shortly along with a link to that resource list we already shared. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon, everyone. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.